And thank you for that. Turn this morning to Mark 15. We're going to finish up the chapter this week. We made it halfway through last week. The trial has come. Pilate played politics with the life of Jesus, and it backfired. The people chose to release the murderer Barabbas instead of the King and Savior Jesus. There is one man in the history of the world that literally understands the meaning of this substitutionary death, and his name was Barabbas. One minute, Barabbas, a sinner, and he knew it. A murderer was in jail, sentenced to die, and the next he was walking free. Why? Because Jesus took his place for his crimes on the cross. And spiritually, that's what happened for us, too. The meaning of the crucifixion for every one of us. Sin is a spiritual crime against our Lord and Creator. Romans 5 says, As by one man sin entered into this world, and death by sin, that's Adam, our father, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So guess what? Sin and death by sin is actually genetic. It's also spiritual. But uh, Jesus... The Son of God takes the penalty of sin on himself. How do we receive this payment? Well, we work really hard. And maybe if we're lucky at the end and our good outweighs our bad, he'll decide to give it to us. No, that's not it at all. That's what the world thinks. The world, I always misunderstood the righteousness of God and righteousness of faith and my own self-righteousness. I thought, be a pretty good person and believe in God and you'll be okay. I actually call that the Northwoods gospel. A lot of us grew up that way in uh, Maine, rural Maine. You know, you've got family and, and football and family is kind of church. You know, that's Sunday. Sunday's, Sunday church is in front of the TV watching the Patriots win or lose. 20 years ago, it was always lose. And then for 20 years, it was always win. And now it's always lose. And so you can make that your church. It's not a good church. But that's the church I grew up when faith and did not faith. No, no. Well, believe in God a little bit, you know, try to do good. And, and as long as you don't kill anybody, you'll make it. That's not how it works at all. We're all born into sin and we can't work our way out of it. We needed God to do something and he did. He sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. And so what we do, the only thing we can do is respond to the work of God by faith. By faith, we repent of our own sin in our own way, and we make a decision in our hearts to trust Jesus Christ personally, not some sort of general trust that he did this for the whole world, although he did, but he specifically did it for me. It has to be personal decision. And then I commit my faith to Jesus Christ. I call on him as my Lord and my Savior, and a spiritual transaction takes place. You might call it being born again from John chapter 3. We might call it being saved. We see these words in the Bible, re religious terms that we use for the spiritual transaction, terms found in the Bible. Romans 10 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. saved. That's right. That's why we use that. 1 Peter 1 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth, through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. These words save, these phrases, born again, they're found in your Bible to refer to what happened when we trust the finished work of God. So now here in Scripture, we're going to come to the awful crucifixion of the Son of God. It's hard to read. And we read some of it last week and we're going to pick up in the middle and continue this week. But it must be read because this here is the single most important event in human history up until now. The Son of God dies for man. The Old Testament pointed to a Messiah that must come and must suffer and save His people from their sin. And so people of Faith at that time received him looking back at their old prophets, but they were also looking forward to the fulfillment while skeptics denied him. And today, it's not much changed in 2,000 years. We look back, every human being, I think, is born asking three questions. 
Where did this all come from? And the answer is Genesis 1. In the beginning, God, not in the beginning, random. Why am I here? And what happens to me after I die? We kind of all have these questions growing up before we get saved that we all have. It's ubiquitous. In other words, everyone kind of goes through these questions. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What happens after I die? It, it takes an atheist to tell you nothing happens after you die. You have to learn that because naturally you don't believe that. Naturally, you think there's more. There's something beyond what I see. Naturally, we all have that put in us by God. The only one that can answer these three questions is Jesus Christ. You'll never get those answers from natural science, which is why the scientific method is so limited. You can't repeat what God has done. It's a miracle. The creation was a miracle. The death, burial, and resurrection were miracles. And so, if you've never answered those questions for yourself, I hope today you will. And trust Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. But we, I guess we want to pick up verse 25. In Matthew, I'm sorry, Mark 15. They had beaten him before his journey to the cross. They had scourged him. Now in verse 25 it says, It was the third hour and they crucified him. They're using Roman time in Mark, so it's noon. Third hour from 9 a.m. So it's about noon when they crucify him. And the superscription of his accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And we talked a little bit about the sign last week. When you compare scripture with scripture, it was actually Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, written in three languages. And with him, they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. You can't take verses like 28 too lightly. When it says the scripture was fulfilled, what that means is, this exact moment was written in advance by the revelation of God by a prophet. God, through his Holy Spirit, gave the prophet what would happen. The prophet wrote it down in the word of God. And then it came true hundreds, maybe even up to a thousand years later, if you're talking about the Psalms of David, to the letter in the life of Jesus Christ. That the scriptures might be fulfilled, speak of foreknowledge and great power. And they, passing by, railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Of course, this is mocking. That's why I'm using that tone. And they that were crucified with him, the thieves, reviled him. Now, one great way to study scripture is to compare scripture with scripture. You get a fuller picture when you do that. I want to do that today. I want to keep a hand here and I want to go on over to Luke. The same account, Luke 23, gives us a little more information So let's pick up at verse 35. I don't want to read the whole thing for time's sake, but verse 35, the people stood beholding and the rulers also with them derided him saying, he saved others, let him save himself if he be Christ, the son of God, always challenging, always mocking. That spirit is alive and well in the world today. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors, bad doers, which were hanged, railed on him saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. And the other answering, we don't have this in the Mark version, rebuked him saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? 
And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. We deserve this. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. So in both of these, we see the mocking going on. We see mocking of people, mostly mocking of rulers. Save yourself, save yourself. Well, they didn't realize he was there to save them. And they crucified him. One of the criminals crucified with Jesus joins in the mockery and scorn. Yeah, if you're really him, save yourself and us. Prove it, Jesus, prove it. The prove it people will never have enough proof. Because for three and a half years, Jesus had been walking in their midst, preaching, teaching, doing good, doing miracles. And they all had seen them. But it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Now, the second criminal, he respected God. Do you not fear God? That shows that in that moment, he is showing his own respect and fear of God. Under the same condemnation, we indeed justly. That shows he knew his own sin. Most people today try to excuse their own sin. Yeah, well, I wouldn't have done it if. I wouldn't have done that if. And they try to push the blame on someone else. Or that's not that bad compared to. And they try to make their own sin relative to someone else's sin. He knew his own sin. This man hath done nothing wrong. He knew Jesus. And he said to Jesus, he's calling out to Jesus, Lord, don't forget how important it is when you see that word in Scripture. Would you just call a guy? <laughs> Would you just call a teacher? Or maybe your professor. <laughs> Would you call them Lord? You know, well, I might call them doctor. Well, they have the word master in Scripture for a, a, a rabbi, for a respected teacher. You don't just call anybody walking down the street Lord. That's a worship word. That's a bow the knee and recognize the authority of word. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he believed Jesus was who he said he was and asked to just be remembered in the kingdom. So to me, this speaks of him believing in the everlasting kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we have here is sort of you could break it down into almost a recipe. I hate, I hate recipes for Christianity. I hate 12 step programs for Christianity. But sometimes it helps us to, to, to break things down into parts to better understand it ourselves and to help other people better understand it and maybe to help ourselves be able to convey the message, right? So when I look at this, I kind of look at uh, starting with respecting God and then recognizing your own sin and then recognizing who Jesus really is. He is the Lord, the promised Christ, and then calling out to him and asking to be part of his kingdom, right? This, what we have here is a, and I think it's the only one in the Bible, deathbed conversion, last minute salvation. And I think the Bible gives us this one example of a last minute salvation so that no one would despair. There's always hope in Jesus. No matter how close to death you are, no matter how much wrong you've done, here's a convicted criminal you know, on the cross, right? And Jesus could save him. But only one, I think, so that no one would really presume. This whole idea of, yeah, I think there's probably something to that, but I just enjoy my sin too much and maybe I'll get saved later on my deathbed. Yeah, you don't get to control that. That's presumption. You may not get another chance. When you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit on your heart to trust Jesus Christ, that's your time. That's your day. It might be today. You might feel the conviction on your heart to repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, personal. You've never done it before. This could be your time. 
I don't know that you'll get another time. So this thief who trusts Jesus Christ in the last moment goes to the same heaven everybody else does, which is an amazing example of the grace of God. And the reason people argue against this is because they don't understand the grace of God. They don't understand the righteousness of God. But what happens here with this concept is you have all kinds of people arguing against it. They say, well, that doesn't seem fair to me. And I've heard this. You mean to say a serial killer. And on his day of execution, he can just repent and trust Christ. And it's okay. While my, for example, maybe Jewish uncle who lived an amazing good life and went to synagogue every Sabbath and, and, and helped people and gave and was good. And I never saw him do wrong. You mean he won't go to heaven? And that's a fundamental misunderstanding. The question rises because of a misunderstanding of good and evil and sin and forgiveness. Number one, let's talk about sin. We all know someone in this life who is relatively better than other people. When we think that's a good person, like they give, they do wonderful things. But what's happening is, is we are comparing them with other people. We're not comparing them to the rule of God's righteousness. And that's the mistake when we think about good and evil. You cannot do enough good to make up for sin. And even though you're whoever it is in your life, that good person you're thinking of that hasn't trusted Christ, even though they may be relatively good, they still have sin. They still have sin. It's not a balance where I do enough good to outweigh my bad and I'll make it. Think, I mean, I'm trying to think of good examples of this, and I thought, and I heard this one once, and I like it. Got a nice shiny white shirt on today, right? It's a nice shiny white shirt, right? So imagine righteousness is kind of like a shiny white shirt. Now, you think of the bad people, and you think that their shirt's all muddy and ripped up and torn. And indeed, Isaiah says, all of my righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Comparison sometimes, clothing and righteousness. But look at this white shirt. You see any blemishes in it? I see a wrinkle there, honey. That's my wife. Anybody else see? (laughs) Now imagine, so imagine it's not this moth eaten, torn up. Imagine I just had, I had a pen in my pocket and one big red spot here. Now, would you say, pastor, I like your mostly white shirt. No, you would say like the hands would instant. Everyone would be like, what happened there? What happened there? Well, that's a good example of the quote unquote good person that has still has sin. They can't escape it. They can't fix that red spot with their goodness. They could go iron it again. They could wash it again. It's not going to work. You need the righteousness of God. So number one, there's this misunderstanding of of sin. And so it's not your own sense of self goodness. Righteousness doesn't come through what you've done. Righteousness comes through what God has done in the person of Jesus Christ. So your friend's works will never match up to who Jesus was and is and what he's done for us. That's what you're saying. You're saying, I don't need the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't need what the Son of God did for me. I'm good enough on my own. Well, obviously, that's ridiculous. And that's the kind of comparison we need to understand. So, since sin cannot be accepted in the presence of God, he has created the one and only way to righteousness. And he's done it. Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, if we go back to the question about the thief uh, versus the uncle, uh, the thief came his own way to God and not God's way. And so you might say, well, well, I'm no thief. Well, this prescription won't work for you then. Jesus came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Right. And, when that, and that's actually a dig. That, that phrase is actually a little bit of a dig. There's none righteous. No, not one. And so you say, I'm not a thief. Right? This kind of pride bursts forth. And okay, well, have you ever lusted? Have you ever lied? 
Have you ever t stolen a pen? You know, a, a paper clip from work that wasn't yours. Oh, what's the big deal there? It's called stealing. That's a sin. And so our crimes are not secular, maybe. His was secular. Our crimes may not be against the American government, but our crimes are spiritual. And even worse than committing a crime against the secular government is committing a crime against the one and only holy creator God. That's what we need to understand about sin. And so the person who proclaims himself not guilty cannot be saved. This person must come to him as a sinner like this man on the cross and says, we deserve this for what we've done. So we have that and then we have the promise. Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. What a wonderful promise to the person who repents and trusts Christ. Amen. And my tie's still up. And my honey's like, fix that. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to Mark 15. So we see the difference between the skeptics and the believer and the believing thief. And folks, we don't have to prove anything to a skeptic. God's already, and we can say that God's already proven it. He proved it through Jesus Christ and what he did in his death, burial, and resurrection. He's, God's already proven it. And if you don't like that, then God's way is not good enough for you. And I'm sorry, I, I wish God's way were good enough for you. Verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. I'm sorry, earlier I said nine. I, I meant noon, that the darkness begins at the sixth hour, which is noon. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, noon to three, in the Middle East. Oh, that was just an eclipse. Those are seven minutes, not three hours. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink, saying, let alone, let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. We still have that phrase today for death. The spirit departs the body. And the veil of the temple was rent in two in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joses and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him, and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. So, okay, we have the darkest hour in the history of our planet. God the Son becomes sin for us. The cross became a kind of altar on which the Lamb of God was sacrificed for the sins of the world. It's funny, in the time when Abraham... Do you know how far before the cross Abraham lived? Anyone? Historian? Yeah, it was about 2,000 years. I don't know exactly. I knew it was a little over 2,000 years. Abraham was told by God to sacrifice... His only son. And God was never going to let him go through it. God just wanted to see if Abraham was going to obey. And he also wanted to give people something to look forward to. Uh, a spiritual type of his own son, Jesus Christ. And so Abraham takes his only son, Isaac. And he lays him on the wood. And he's about to sacrifice his own son. And the angel came and said, stay your hand. God will provide himself a lamb. And 
a lamb shows up in the thicket and they're able to take the lamb instead of his son. And the world waited 2,000 years for that to actually happen. God provided himself a lamb, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years from Abraham to Jesus. And now what's funny is a lot of people today will say, aren't you Christians? Haven't you, why are you still holding on to this? I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Nothing's going to happen. The, the words of Jesus can't be true. It's been too long. And I, and I want to say this. We have examples in the scriptures where God waited 2,000 years to do something and did it. And you know, I think we're right on time. To, I mean, here it has been another 2,000 years. Jesus said, I will come. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He's coming again. Come on. Where's the promise of his coming? God is long-suffering. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The reason God has waited so long is so that he could allow more people to get saved and come to heaven with him. And won't you come with me? Amen. That's where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. I've trusted not because of my own goodness, but because I've repented and humbled myself and trusted Jesus. I recognize there's no possible way I could make it myself. And you say, it's been 2,000 years. God's right on time. And he might come in my lifetime. He might not. It might be more time. I don't know. But I'm watching and waiting every day. Maybe the Lord will come today. It'd be great if he came before I finish my message. But it'd be good to be in church when the Lord came back again. Amen. <laughs> it'd be bad to be skipping. <laughs> Everyone else getting caught up in the clouds. And where are you skipping? Yeah, okay. And so, but here, the Holy Father had to turn his back on the Son in the hour that Jesus took my sin and took your sin. That's why he calls my father, my father, why hast thou forsaken me? Because in that moment, he becomes sin. And he, Jesus, the son, had never been separated in the spirit from God, the father, until that moment. There are some non-Christian historians of the day, Thallus and Phlegon, who wrote of darkness and an earthquake on this very day. God showing man, I believe, the darkness of sin and the darkness of their own hearts. So Jesus gave up the ghost. He yielded up his spirit. He did this willingly for you and me. And we have the John, the John cross reference tells us there's an earthquake. We don't see it here in Mark. Mark didn't write about the earthquake, but I think it was John that wrote about the earthquake. But now we see we go to the temple. Jesus dies gives up his spirit. And in the temple, this great, wonderful temple that every, all the Jews loved and pointed to and was supposed to be representative of God on earth. And there was a section of the temple called the Holiest of Holies. And there was a veil there. And only the high priest could enter in there. And only once a year to offer for the sins of the people. And they literally put a rope around his waist and bells on his boots so that they could hear him moving in there because if he wasn't gone in fully prepared, then God could potentially strike him dead for, a preach, for approaching his holiness, not prepared. And they would be ready to drag him out. Well, on that day that Christ gave up the ghost, the veil of the temple ripped in two, not from the bottom to the top, from the top to the bottom, because God did it, not man. And... This changed, this whole, sep this whole temple issue, this whole holiest of holies setup that God had for the Jew in the Old Testament changed on this day. God does this. The veil was a separation of man from the holiest of holies. And the high priest was a kind of mediator between God and the people. But that all changed when Christ died. There is no more holy building. There is no more holiest of holies or earthly veil. There is no need for an earthly mediator. Some denominations try to keep that up. They have a celibate priesthood that you can confess your sins to and give you a way to have your sins forgiven. Say five. Hail Marys. And that's an abomination. That's an abomination to God. That is so false and wrong. 
No human being, I cannot forgive your sins. I cannot give you a path of penance other than to repent and ask forgiveness from God the Father through the Son, Jesus Christ, who is our new high priest and our new mediator between God and man. You can go directly to God now through Jesus Christ. You bow your head in prayer, you're in the holiest of holies. I can't forgive your sins. Don't confess your sins to me. Now the Bible does say confess your faults one to another. If you want to, you know, some churches turn like public meetings into a big sin confession. <laughs> like I don't really maybe need to know all the details. But if you want to have some private counseling and we'll pray about things that you're struggling with, that's a difference, right? I'm talking about some apples and oranges here. 1 John 1, nine says, If we confess our sins... Not to a man, but to God. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we confess to Christ, not to man. And the tearing of the veil shows us how everything changed and how God reaches and deals with mankind in that moment. He's moving from a nation to a church. And there's a progression that's going to happen from here through the book of Acts until we get to the Paul's epistles. But then we have, so we have the tearing of the veil. Now we have the centurion who watched it all happen. And I don't know, did he hear the conversation between Jesus and the thief? Maybe. Did he see people standing around weeping? Maybe. Did he hear earlier when Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Who, said, who does that when they're being executed falsely by their enemies? Well, the Son of God does. So maybe he saw all this and he does say, truly, this man was the Son of God in verse 39. And so we have the thief on the cross being the deathbed confession, if you will. And then we have the Roman centurion, it appears, being the first to trust Jesus Christ after his death, but before the resurrection. We have these ladies serving. They're preparing. They want to honor the body of Jesus. And then we get to verse 42. And now when the even was come, because it was the preparation that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly unto Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. He's a rich man and he's going to give up his own sepulcher for Jesus. And Pilate marveled if he, if Jesus were already dead, and calling unto him the centurion, he asked him whether he had been any while dead. And when he knew it of the centurion, he gave the body to Joseph. And he bought fine linen and took him down and wrapped him in the linen and laid him in a sepulcher which was hewn out of a rock and rolled a stone under the door of the sepulcher. And we know from cross-references that the rolling of the stone over the door wasn't about Joseph, it was about the Jews and Pilate wanting to seal the, seal the tomb so that the Jews couldn't fake a resurrection. And Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joses, beheld where he was laid. So I want to talk about Joseph of Arimathea. And I don't have all the cross references ready today. I, I didn't know if we'd have time for all those. I probably could have. But as you study the scriptures through, you'll see that Joseph of Arimathea seemed kind of like a secret believer. Because at the time, it really, really cost you something to identify with Jesus Christ. It really cost you something in society. The ruling class had been, called him an outcast and a liar and a, you know, a miscreant and were actually trying to find him and locate him and, and people were supposed to give him up to the local authorities. And so... There are a lot of people who, were, who believed but were weighing the cost of coming out publicly about their faith in Christ. And uh, 
It cost a lot for someone like Joseph of Arimathea to side with Jesus Christ. And I'll say this, in the West right now, uh, it might cost you something in certain circles too. Uh, one thing I see that I want to challenge people with is I see people willing to identify with all kinds of people. I see people who are willing to identify with teams and wear the team's jerseys. Well, that's easy because everyone does that. I see people, so where does it cost something? Well, I think of, I think of an election not too long ago where I would see Christians putting on red MAGA hats. And you know what? I would see them do that but not be willing to identify with Jesus Christ. Now that's a problem because you're willing to potentially suffer for a political ruler, <laughs> leader, but you won't do it for Jesus Christ. And so that's out of order. That's backwards. But Joseph now stands up boldly before Rome and before all the Jews and identifies with Christ by saying, I want his body I will bury him. I respect this man who you've all called a liar and a blasphemer. But also, so I want to say this. Identify with Jesus Christ. Let people know. Tell people, I believe. Absolutely. No, that's not crazy at all. And let me tell you why. There's way more evidence for Jesus Christ than there is for some magical, natural beginning of the universe there's way more evidence for what we believe than there is for atheism and then go on to talk about the scriptures and what jesus has done identify with jesus christ sooner than later if you haven't started in a certain friendship dynamic or work dynamic ask god an opportunity to do that and for the boldness to do that and do that amen, amen. Pilate now, notice this. This might seem innocuous. He marveled whether or not Jesus was already dead. And the reason Jesus died so soon is because they had beaten him so badly before they hung him on the cross. But he verifies the death of Jesus Christ. And the reason this is important is because one of the common lies is, well, you know, maybe he wasn't really dead. Maybe, maybe Jesus never really died. And so that's how he was able to appear to everybody because they just snuck him away. Well, a Roman centurion's not going to do that. And this was a public event in front of everybody. And the Roman centurion whose duty it was to be accountable for this execution verified before Pilate that Jesus had actually died on the cross. And of course, we know that they had also driven a spear through his side to be sure. That's how they verified. They verified by running a spear through someone. What we have here in Scripture is multiple witnesses, multiple verifications of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord. He's coming soon. Are you ready for him to come again? Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed, please.